Welcome to episode 102 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the saga of Fritea, where Fritea is nearly overcome by sea witches and storms, but lands safely at the Isle of Angontir in chapters 10 and 11 of Fritea's Forge. Chapter 10, Fritea's Forge. Cold blew the wind. Day by day the skies darkened. Deck and mast, sail and rudder were covered thick with ice and frost. Fritioff was already far from his native shores when suddenly black storm clouds overspread the heavens and a fearful tempest arose. The sea was stirred to its depths. Waves, mountain high, threatened to engulf the ship, which tossed helplessly amid the boiling surges. But Fritioff exulted in the fury of the elements. The wild scene upon which he gazed was but a reflection of the storm that raged within his breast. Still, the tempest increased. Showers of hailstorms rattled down upon the deck and on the numbed hands of the warriors at the helm. A gust of wind tore away the cordage. Planks and timbers groaned and creaked. Huge billows swept the deck, and higher and higher rose the water in the hold, despite all the efforts of the ship's people, who now gave themselves up for lost. Even to Fritia, it seemed death was nigh. It is Helga that hath sent this storm upon us, said one. And who may withstand witchcraft? Look, cried another, yonder swims a whale and bears on its back two sea fiends. One is wrapped in the hide of the ice bear, and the other hath the shape of a sea eagle with black wings flapping. Woe, woe unto us, tis the sea trolls, hide and ham, we are lost. But the tail, summoning his friend Bjorn to take the helm, hastened to reassure the terror-stricken crew. His words put fresh courage in their hearts, and with redoubled strength they began once more to struggle against the fury of the storm. Courage, friends, he shouted. Those who trust in the gods are safe from the power of evil spirits. Then, springing to the ship's prow, he chanted, Now, you lead us. Show us whether, as tis boasted, hero would thy bosom holds. Listen, art thou truly I year's god sprung daughter? Dash with thy strong keel, and cleave yon spell charmed well. With one bound the dragon clove the troll whale's body, and down it sank beneath the waves. Then at once the hero hurleth two sharp spears. The ice bears high, pierceth one, the other springeth through the pitch black eagle's side. Instantly the storm subsided. The sun broke through the clouds, and the waves no longer swept the deck. Soon the sea was as smooth as glass, and there before them lay the islands ruled by Angantir. But the weary rowers could no longer move their arms. The warriors were forced to lean for support upon their swords. When the ship touched land, Bjorn carried four, and Fritioff eight of the exhausted men ashore. Food and drink were then brought from the ship, and all refreshed themselves with a hearty meal. Chapter 11 Fritioff at the Court of Angontir In his great hall near the sea sat Angontir at Wassel with his champions, while outside the window Halvar kept watch. A good swordsman and stout drinker was he, and often as his horn was empty, he silently thrust it through the lattice to be refilled. 
Suddenly, he flung it far into the hall and shouted, I see a ship making to land. On it pale warriors totter helplessly about, but so strong and fresh are two of them that they carry the others to the shore. Angontir strode to the window and gazed out toward the sea. Then he said, That, methinks, hath the look of Ulida, Thorstein's dragon ship, and in one of the yonder two stout warriors I seem to see old Thorstein's form and bearing. Hath he not the heir of a prince of all the land? When the black-bearded Atla heard this, the berserk fury seized him. He sprang from the board, and the eyes rolling and shouting, If this be free Teof, now will I prove the truth of what is said, that he hath power to render harmless every blade, and never is the first to sue for peace. He rushed from the hall, followed by twelve of the warriors, hewing and thrusting furiously at the air with their swords. They stormed down to the shore where Friteof had built the fire to cheer his men. From afar, Atla shouted, Easy word now for me to slay thee, but rather shalt thou have thy choice, to do battle with me here or fly. But if thou wilt yield and sue for peace, then in friendly guise I'll lead thee to our lord. Is it your custom thus to welcome toil-worn heroes cast upon your shores? was Friteof's answer. Then listen, spent as I am with days of hardship and distress, yet never will I sue for peace from thee. And therewith he drew his sword, the runes on the blade growing red as fire, fast and furious fell the sword strokes, but shields at the same moment dropped, riven in twain upon the ground. Yet fearlessly the champions fought on. At last down swept Unger Vardil with resistless force, and loudly clanging Atla's blade was shattered. For Teof stepped back, saying, Swordless, I will not slay thee. But if thou wouldst not yet have peace, then let us try a wrestling contest. Foaming with rage, Atlas sprang at him, and a fearful struggle began. Like two eagles seizing on their prey, they grappled with each other. The earth shook with the trampling of their feet. It seemed as if the heaving of their breasts would burst the encasing mail, while in awe their comrades stood about them waiting for the issue of the contest. At length, Thorstein's mighty son succeeded in throwing his adversary, and kneeling on his breast, he cried, Were it but my sword within my grasp, its blade ere now had pierced thee, thou swarthy berserk. <laughs> Go then and fetch it. I will lie here for the while, said Atla proudly. All brave men to Valhalla's halls must wend at last, I to-day and thou to-morrow. Still, filled with the rage of battle, for Teof, with one bound, reached his sword and was about to dispatch his prostrate foe, who moved not, but lay calmly gazing upward, when he suddenly relented and, dropping the sword, held out his hand to the vanquished Atla. Just then, Halvard came hurrying thither, waving a white wand and crying, Cease your furious strife! The savory viands that await ye grow cold in those silver dishes, and my thirst doth press me sore. Therewith, the two heroes, who but now had striven in deadly combat together, sought the court of Angontir in peace. The appearance of the great hall filled Fritiof with astonishment. In place of the usual oaken planks, the walls were covered with gilded leather adorned with flowering vines. The chimney was of marble. Tapers in silver candlesticks illuminated the halls. The doors were held fast with locks. 
A bountiful meal stood ready spread in heavy silver dishes, and near the high seat a roasted stag adorned the board. The horns entwined with leaves, the hooves gilded. On the high seat of silver sat Ongontir, clad in helm and mail of glittering steel, inlaid with gold. A purple mantle sewn with silver stars, depending from his shoulders. He arose as Fritea entered, and advanced to meet his guest, saying, Full many a horn have I drained in Thorstein's company, and glad am I to do fitting honor to this his valiant son. Then, leading him to a place beside him on the high seat, he called on all his warriors to fill their horns and beakers and drink to Thorstein's memory. While the hall rang to the sound of harps as minstrels praised that hero's glorious deed. Meanwhile, Angantyr questioned his guest concerning matters in the Northland, and in well-chosen words, avoiding either praise or blame, Fritia related all that had passed, concluding with his voyage and the terrible sea witches against whose powers they had been forced to contend. So eloquently did he describe their adventures that Angantyr listened with approving smiles, and the bold champions about the board often interrupted the speaker with their shouts. Then Angantyr inquired the purpose of his voyage, and Fritjof told him frankly of his love for Ingeborg, of Helga's arrogance, and the penance that had been laid upon him. For this I come, he concluded, to demand of thee in behalf of King Helga and Hafton the tribute thou wast wont to pay in Bella's lifetime. Calmly, Angantir replied, Never have I owned another as my lord. Free do I live. Free also are my people about these seas. What I said Bella was not in force, but given in friendship. His sons I know not. If they would have tribute from me, let them demand it with the sword. Then shall they have the best of answers. Yet thy father was my friend. He beckoned to his daughter, who sat near him on a golden stool, and she hastened to the women's chamber, soon returning with a purse whereon was worked with rare skill a green forest scene. Animals of gold wandered beneath the trees, and above shone a silver moon. The tassels were strung with costly pearls, the clasp enriched with rubies. Angantir took this purse, filled it to the brim with pieces of gold, and handed it to his guest, saying, Take this as a gift of welcome, son of Thorstein, and do with it as thou wilt. But as for the claim, I refuse to acknowledge any such. How now my wish? Tarry thou till spring comes as my honored guest. Courage and boldness stand thee well in time of danger, it is true. Yet think not thy new leader may withstand all the perils of the stormy season. And remember, there are demons in the sea more mighty yet than those which thou dost vanquish. To this, Fritioff gladly agreed, and he held out his hand to his hospitable host, saying, Be it then as thou wilt. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.